Cindy Crosby lives in the Midwest, where she spends endless hours tracking, observing, studying, and writing about dragonflies and the American prairie. It was through Cindy's blog, Tuesdays in the Tall Grass, that I first learned of her passion for dragonflies and her book, Chasing Dragonflies. It was after reading her book that I contacted Cindy to see if she would join me on Nature Revisited to talk about her passion for dragonflies, Tuesdays in the Tall Grass, and Prairie. Dragonflies, it seems, deserve a lot more attention than what we are giving them. An insect that has been around for a long, long time, but often ignored. This summer, Cindy joined me on the phone to share her love of dragonflies and a few excerpts from her book. Here is my conversation with Cindy Crosby. My name is Stefan Van Norden, and this is Nature Revisited. Dragonflies, this is the dragonfly season. It is. We are in the thick of the dragonfly season right now, Stefan. So when did you first start chasing dragonflies? Well, you know, um, in my book, Chasing Dragonflies, A Natural, Cultural, and Personal History, the early part of the book, I talked about how dragonflies really changed my life. But I didn't always see them. And in fact, I don't think I really noticed them, other than maybe seeing a motif on a mug or a pair of earrings, until we moved to the Chicago region. There was a bridge over the tall grass prairie that I used to sit on with my journal. And as I would sit there, I would notice damselflies, ebony jewel-wing damselflies. And at first I thought they were butterflies. I'd never seen these black butterflies before. And then once I got closer to them and began photographing them and putting them in my sketchbook, I realized they were damselflies. Damselflies and dragonflies are very closely related. And when I talk about monitoring or chasing dragonflies, I also mean damselflies as well. So that was kind of my introduction to those. And in 2005, I started monitoring them which is just a more formal way of counting individuals and the numbers of species every year. That was one of the most exciting and life-changing things I have done, I think. It pretty much frames my year now. So what is it about dragonflies that fascinates you so much? Uh, we know there's a lot of reasons to care. I think, uh, first of all, Dragonflies and damselflies are beautiful, and boy, after going through 2020 and COVID, we, we sure are looking for beauty. A lot of us spent more time outdoors, so maybe more people notice dragonflies than have seen them before. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to care. I was sitting with someone in a restaurant. They asked what I was doing that day, and I said, I'm going out to count dragonflies, and they laughed and laughed, and they were like, well, why would anybody want to do that? And it's a great question. We know that monitoring dragonflies and damselflies gives us important information about how our climate is changing. So when we count their numbers and species, we learn what happens to insects and aquatic populations by temperature. This year has been a great example because of the drought we've had, a very severe drought in the Chicago region. We see those populations change. When we go out and monitor dragonflies and damselflies, we learn what happens when we change a wetland or we pollute a river or change the character. So, for example, there is a route I walk at a place called Nechusa Grasslands. It's a nature conservancy site out in Franklin Grove, Illinois. It's about a 4,000 acre site and my routes are you know, a very small part of that. But we have a lot of beavers and the beavers love to come in and 
change things from streams to ponds or something that's dry to a wetland. And the dragonflies and damselflies change right along with it. That gives us important information about what happens when we change something in our uh, landscape. What we discover informs the future of the management of prairies, of marshes, of bogs, of woodlands and wetlands. We could say dragonflies, uh, Stefan, are a barometer of the health of the world, and that's the world we're leaving to our children and our grandchildren. So why do you think that dragonflies, it seems to me, have been kind of neglected or overlooked? And I love the title, Chasing Dragonflies, that, you know, these are important insects, but they haven't really been on the radar that much, have they? Uh, is a great observation, Stefan. And the truth is, pollinators have much better press agents. Dragonflies are not pollinators. In fact, they will eat pollinators, so people usually don't like to hear that. But they are an important part of the balance of the natural world. The reason most of us don't think of dragonflies and damselflies is we haven't trained our eyes to see them. They are all around us all the time. When I sit at a stoplight and I look up at that light during the summer, I almost always see a dragonfly. When you're at a ball game, if you were at a Cubs baseball game, you would see dragonflies. They're not very large. They don't get talked about a lot. We have to filter what we see. So most people never see damselflies, and maybe they'll see a dragonfly once in a while. And you know, in a world that is just so full of competing things for our attention, it's really hard to train ourselves just to be quiet and to be still and to see the smaller things. Seeing dragonflies and damselflies requires a lot of patience and a lot of paying attention. So what role do the dragonflies play in the larger ecosystem? There's a couple of things that have been very prominent in the news. Bird populations have been a big issue, you know, plummeting bird populations. We're losing insects. Dragonflies and damselflies are insects, and we're losing birds. Birds depend on those insects for sustenance. So they're a very key part of the ecosystem. Dragonflies and damselflies, they are carnivores, so they're only going to eat other insects. That is a very healthy thing for us as well. Again, elaborate on how important they are to other insects as well as to us. You know, dragonflies have been around in some form, not exactly as they are today, for some estimates say 300 million years, 350 million years. That's a long time. And they're virtually unchanged except for their size. Uh, they're a lot smaller than they were. So uh, we know they're pretty tough. We know they eat a lot of insects. And we know that birds depend on them as far as something to eat. So... They are an important part of a healthy system. So how many different species are there? Unlike some other species, birds, let's say, you don't read about a new bird being discovered very often. Just a couple of years ago in Africa, there were 80 new species of odonates or dragonflies, damselflies, that were found. There are more species to be found. The estimate right now is between six and 7,000 species in the world, and that's worldwide, and that includes both dragonflies and damselflies. But that number is always shifting as we find new species. You can find uh, dragonflies and damselflies just about anywhere. The one thing they have that ties them, I would say, to a particular place is that they need water to reproduce. So you will find dragonflies, like I said, at a baseball stadium or at a garden center, but there has to be a water source somewhere that they emerge from that they return to for mating. So as a gardener, how would I attract them? There is a whole chapter in Chasing Dragonflies about 
attracting them to your yard. It's called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. One thing I have done in my yard, Stefan, is to dig a very small pond. And by small, I mean probably 7 by 10 feet that I dug out with a shovel. Get lots and lots of damselflies especially that are attracted to that. The most important thing you can do, though, in your yard is not to spray. Another thing to do is to ensure you have a diversity of plants. I work really hard to incorporate a lot of native plants, but for the dragonfly, it's not really important whether it's a native plant or not. Also, that you have some places where a dragonfly or damselfly might hide from predators like birds. So they would be attracted to a place maybe that had, you know, a little bit of lawn, uh, a really nice garden with lots of plants in different heights a water feature of some sort. So you can always have a half barrel of water. Even little moving water is great. And then um, places for them to hide if it rains, if there's a heavy downpour, or when the birds are coming through your yard um, so they feel safe. For each of us, dragonflies will be a little different. But I hope that curiosity will send you to exploring some of the beautiful dragonflies that you have, not only in your yard, but in your region. The dragonflies and damselflies will reward your attention with their beauty, with their fascinating aerial dynamics, and their endless diversity. And seeing dragonflies is something you can take with you. Dragonflies are found, I think, on every continent but Antarctica. When I went to England or to Italy, you know, that was one of the joys of travel is seeing these new species of dragonflies and feeling that connection to a new part of the world through a familiar insect. Yeah, as the poet Mary Oliver says, pay attention, be astonished, and then tell people about it. I hope people will pay attention to dragonflies will be as astonished as I have been, and then we'll tell other people about the dragonflies and what they're seeing. One of the most fascinating things um, about dragonflies that people, many people don't know is that several species migrate. Here in the Chicago region where I live, we know we have four major migrators, the common green darner, the black saddlebag, the variegated meadowhawk, and the wandering glider. And there's probably several others that migrate as well. You know, a lot of people know about monarchs and their migration. I think with dragonflies and their migration, we're kind of at that point in understanding it as scientists were with monarchs 50 years ago. So we're really learning a lot, trying to understand more about where they go and how many dragonflies generations go down and how many come back. So we do know that they go at least as far as the Gulf Coast, probably Central America from Chicago region, which is quite a long way. And they follow particular landforms, maybe along Lake Michigan or in some areas of the country, mountain ranges. A big group will go down and we'll see them migrating through at the end of August or early September in large swarms. And then they come back singly, and this is a different generation that comes back, but it'll come back they'll come back singly, usually in March or April here in the Chicago region. And every day it seems like we learn something new about dragonfly migration. You know, that this part of the science is still has a lot of mystery in it. Do you have anything that you can share with us about the folklore of dragonflies? Most cultures, you will find people who have a fear of insects. And dragonflies really reflect that fear. A lot of the connotations, the associations people have with dragonflies are negative. And so you'll hear things like um, dragonflies were called the devil's darning needle, uh, for example, or uh, the devil's riding horse. That's another one. My favorite is uh, dragonflies in some cultures. I think the Germans called uh, dragonflies the devil's grandmother. So you're like, really? You know, what? such an evil symbol. And I think it's because, you know, dragonflies um, are they're, they're ferocious predators. You know, they are carnivores. They fly really fast. 
if you look at their mandibles, which is their mouth, and they're full of curved hooks, which can look pretty, you know, scary if you got that close to them. A lot of people are worried they'll get bitten by a dragonfly. And a dragonfly could, a big one could nip you, but, but the, it's only going to nip you if you're handling it. It's not going to fly up and bite you. Uh, dragonflies have a lot of association, too, with the afterlife. In some cultures, it was believed they would take the souls of people to the afterlife. So there there are good connotations. Italians call them the guardians of the water. And there's an excellent book called A Dazzle of Dragonflies that I would encourage people to check out if they're interested in really dive into the culture. Or there's a chapter in my book, too, called uh, The Girl with the Dragonfly Tattoo that um, talks a lot about the superstitions and some of the cultural baggage that dragonflies have carried around with them. So I'm reading Chapter 10 from Chasing Dragonflies, A Natural, Cultural, and Personal History. And Chapter 10 is The Girl with the Dragonfly Tattoo. A dragonfly tattoo might be fun, or maybe it's more serious than that. The appeal comes in part from talking to so many people who have dragonfly tattoos and hearing their stories. Why are so many people walking around with a dragonfly tattoo? Maybe it's because dragonflies are powerful symbols. Perhaps it's their natural history cycle, that nymph clambering around in the darkness underwater, then emerging, shedding the old self, sprouting wings, and taking flight. After I gave a talk on dragonflies and damselflies, a woman patiently stood in line to speak with me. I want to tell you my story, she said. My best friend died a few years ago, she continued. On the day she died, a dragonfly showed up and hovered nearby. Each year on the day of her death, I see a dragonfly. She showed me her tattoo. I'm not a woo-woo kind of person, but I confess her story and the seriousness in which she told it to me made the hair stand up on my arms. After all, some cultures believe dragonflies are messengers from another world. Who knows? As I walked into a park district headquarters to speak for a garden club, the middle-aged man working the desk joshed me about my big green net. Are you giving a talk on butterflies, he asked. I told him I was doing a program on dragonflies. Immediately, he walked out from behind his desk. I have to tell you my story, he said. He recounted how, on the day his teenage son left for college, a cloud of dragonflies appeared in his yard. Is this a good thing, he asked me seriously. A father torn between pride and fear, watching his teenage son leave home for the first time to try his wings in the outside world. A woman grieving the loss of her dear friend, looking for a sign her friend's spirit was not eternally extinguished. The dragonflies were there with them on those days. They were witnesses, a part of their lives, and they were a comfort. So other than going to your book, Chasing Dragonflies. Do you have a website that people can visit? I would encourage you to check out the website. It's cindycrosby.com. And then the blog is Tuesdays in the Tall Grass. comes out every Tuesday. And I do blog quite a bit about dragonflies as well as the tall grass prairie. So that's a blog I've been writing since 2014. comes out every Tuesday morning. I try to look at some aspect of the natural world, usually the tall grass prairie. I have a prairie, a very small prairie in my backyard. I blog about that. And then uh, dragonflies and insects and other creatures that are in the natural world. Uh, There were a lot of butterflies this week, the regal fritillary, the Baltimore checker spot. But uh, I saw them when I was out dragonfly monitoring on a prairie. So you can see how those things all kind of end up being tied back to prairie. I think it goes back again to that Mary Oliver quote that has been so influential for me. Pay attention. Be astonished. I have been trying to learn to pay closer attention. Um, I've always been astonished by the natural world. 
um, not just keeping it to yourself, but sharing your love of something, your passion for something with other people and seeing them get excited about it as well. So I swore I would never write a blog. And in 2014, I had to ask myself, what is it about writing a blog that makes you not want to do it? I have to say it's been a really good discipline for me to do 52 blogs every year and to focus very closely on the tall grass prairie, dragonflies, and the natural world. I've learned a lot from my readers, too. They leave me great notes on the blog, and they tell me things that I didn't know. So it is not just a solitary endeavor. It feels like part of a bigger prairie community out there and a bigger community of people that love the natural world. And I'm always inspired, Stefan, by just finding out how many people really do care. And I need that reassurance sometimes. It wasn't until we moved to the Chicago region we were uprooted, I would say, from our friends and our our family. We moved to a place where we didn't know anyone. And my kids were in school. I would go out and walk at the Morton Arboretum Schulenberg Prairie. And it was a great place to walk, to kind of gather my thoughts. And pretty soon I started noticing the plants, the life of the prairie, uh, the nighthawks in the evening, the uh, bird life during the day, the blue heron that waited in Willoway Brook, which is a stream that goes through the prairie. And I started investigating, you know, what what is this place? I learned it was a tall grass prairie, and I started reading and asking people about it. It was so captivating to me to see this suite of plants, this group of plants that I learned, continued to learn about it, was shaped by fire. And the first prairie burn I saw just blew my mind to find I was standing at one edge and just to see this place that I love to walk uh, destroyed, I thought, by fire, you know, intentional fire. It's that cycle of fire that's that rejuvenates the prairie. Uh, without the fire, it would become a woodland. I think it was that symbolic destruction of the prairie that really helped me fall in love with it. And there are no tall grass prairies um, in the world except in this very small region that stretches from Canada down to Texas and comes up through Illinois. It's a resilient ecosystem and yet very fragile, and it's been broken, uh, mostly broken by uh, development, the John Deere plow back in the 1800s when we first were able to farm the fertile soil, the lack of fire. Um, As we suppressed fire, the prairie went away, became woodland. And so just that knowledge that this prairie has almost disappeared. Here in Illinois, there's only um, about 2,700 acres of high-quality original prairie that remains in the state. You know, how can we bring that back? Why should we bring it back? And once we start learning the stories of the prairie plants, we start learning the stories of the people who walked through prairies, the Native Americans who continue to use the prairies uh, medicinally, uh, ceremonial needs, then you realize this is an important part of our story, our human story, that needs to be passed down to our children. And I have six grandchildren, and I want them all to know prairie and to love prairie because we are a much poorer people without this uh, beautiful landscape that here in Illinois, the prairie state, uh, we call home. All right. Um, Cindy, how about we finish this conversation with another reading from your book, Chasing Dragonflies? Sure, yeah, just a little bit from the epilogue, the very last part of the book. It's a curious thing to become involved in the natural world. Your perspective changes. You're aware of the brevity of life, the vulnerability of the tiniest insect. Now, 60 years old, I'm aware that each year is something to be cherished. Time is precious. The world is a fascinating place. How could anyone be bored? 
Look around and there are a hundred amazing things to investigate. Open your eyes and you see clouds build and swirl. Insects buzz by. Sit still long enough in the spring and you can watch a bloodroot wildflower open before your eyes. Paying attention to dragonflies and damselflies is a way of practicing focus. It's not for the impatient or the person who eschews discomfort. Chasing dragonflies doesn't cost a penny, but it does require an investment of time. It requires patience, a willingness to wait and then to see what comes an openness to mystery, a resistance to killing time. Instead, it's a desire to invest your time wisely. I hope you'll have a heightened awareness of dragonflies and notice them whenever you're sitting at a traffic light, walking alongside a lake or a pond. Being attentive to what is around us in the world is a gift in itself. The dragonflies and damselflies will reward your attention with their beauty, their fascinating aerial dynamics, and their endless diversity. Chasing dragonflies encourages us to dive deep, appreciate beauty, practice gratitude, merry amazement. So much about the future is unknown. One thing I'm sure of, however I spend the time left to me, months, years, or several decades, I want to live intentionally to be awake and aware. The dragonflies help me do just that. I can't wait for the next season to begin. I hope you enjoyed my visit with Cindy Crosby and that maybe you will see dragonflies in a different light. And I hope you will follow Cindy's blog, Tuesdays in the Tall Grass. The music for this episode is Song of a Dragonfly by Boris G. And I hope you will share Nature Revisited with friends, family, and colleagues. And subscribe to Nature Revisited on your favorite podcast server. You can also follow us on Instagram, YouTube, or our website, nordenproductions.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N, productions.com. If you would like to share your thoughts or comments, please send them to us through our website contact page, and we will share them. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Norden and Charles Gagan. And I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature. Nature.